Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and this is the Corona Watch. And we have today Randall Holcomb, MD, MBA at the Cancer Research Center uh, in Jabsom. And we're going to talk to him about uh, the immune system and cancer and how those things relate to coronavirus. It's not easy. It's complicated. Randall, thank you so much for joining us today. Jay, my pleasure. So, uh, you know, I guess the, uh, the, the first thing is uh, the immune system is central in, in, in coronavirus, but the immune system is also central in, in cancer. So there must be multiple intersections. Can you, can, you, uh, can you drill down on some of those intersections? Sure, I think there, there are many things related to the immune system for cancer patients that are important while we think about this coronavirus uh, pandemic. We know that uh, patients with cancer uh, tend to get a suppressed immune system. Most of that suppression of the immune system is due to treatment, due to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. There are a few kinds of cancer that in and of themselves suppress the immune system. Leukemia, for example, and lymphoma uh, tend to markedly uh, suppress the immune system. But most of the more common malignancies, such as breast cancer and prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer, uh, don't in and of themselves suppress the immune system that much, but the immune system is markedly suppressed when people get chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Our main concern is with the coronavirus is that patients uh, with cancer who have a suppressed immune system uh, may have uh, much more difficulties uh, with handling the virus infection than other patients. Now, how does that reconcile with the notion that, uh, you know, what, what really hurts a coronavirus patient is the immune system overreacting to the virus in the lungs. So if my immune system is suppressed, then maybe it won't overreact. Maybe that's a good thing. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it, could that be a good thing? So the answer is yes, it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Uh, and I think we really don't know. Um, one of the things that we've done here at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center is we've signed on to a national study, which is led by a group at uh, Vanderbilt. And this study actually collects information about cancer patients who are infected uh, with the COVID-19 uh, virus and tracks how people do. And we submit all of that information into a large database so that we can try to ascertain what happens to cancer patients who have a suppressed immune system when they get this virus? I think we all worry that they might do worse because their immune system can't fight off the viral uh, infection. But we do know that some of the damage to the tissues is caused by the immune response. And so perhaps that lessening of the immune response may in some ways be beneficial for these patients. It's really hard to know, and I think we don't have the information at the moment, and that's why it's so important that we collect the information. One of the other things that we found, and I think you've probably heard on the news, is that some populations are much more severely affected than other populations uh, across the United States. And one of the things that uh, we'll have the advantage of doing here in Hawaii is collecting information on a population that's particularly relevant to the people here in Hawaii and is not information that's generally being collected across the rest of the United States. So that's one of the reasons we thought it was so important for us to participate uh, in this uh, study. Yeah, uh, well, you know, Hawaii is a living laboratory of diverse, uh, diverse uh, cultures and, and, and DNA and what have you, and uh, that could be very valuable. Uh, as it seems to me that uh, we need to know as much about how the immune system works in the, in the face of uh, COVID as we can, because ultimately, am I right about this? Ultimately, we want to be able to tune the immune system to do the right thing, to fight the virus, but not fight the body. And if you can get it right down the center of the track that way by tuning it somehow, therapeutically or otherwise, uh, then you can have the best of, best of those two alternatives. Am I right about that kind of analysis? That would be great. Uh, I think we don't have the tools uh, to fine tune the immune system that well. Uh, we do have medications that will suppress the immune system. We have medications that will stimulate the immune system uh, and understanding how to stimulate a part of the immune system and not another part is really difficult. And I think we're not quite there yet from a scientific point of view. 
Okay, but hold that thought. You never know these days. What about what about the antibody thing? Um, you know, we have antibodies, and antibodies are part of the testing protocol now. I, although I doubt it's available in many places. Um, and then you have antibodies from somebody who had the disease, and maybe that can help somebody somebody else uh, in in fighting the disease. Um, where where does that fit with the immune system? And is, is it is it really true? <laughs> is it really useful? Well, I think antibodies are always good when you get infected with something. You typically get antibodies, you get some immunity for some period of time. Um, I think we don't know with uh, COVID-19 how long people will have immunity. We do know that some common colds are caused by coronavirus and you will get immunity for a short period of time, but then it goes away and you can get that cold again from that same virus. So uh, we're hoping that it's more long lasting uh, immunity that people get. One of the things for cancer patients is that when, especially when they're under treatment and we affect the B cells, with, that's one component of the immune system that makes antibodies. The thing we don't know is whether uh, the B cells will function normally to produce antibodies against this coronavirus. And so we, we don't even know if, if cancer patients who get infected with coronavirus are going to generate antibodies at the same rate as uh, other people are. I think that's something we're going to have to learn over time, but we don't know that at the moment. One thing that strikes me is that, you know, it, and it goes back to the, the common flu. Um, I mean, the one that doesn't kill you necessarily, um, where, where every year you have to get another, another shot, a, a whole fresh vaccine. And that means that the, the virus is different year to year. And that means to me, and I'm, I'm just going you know, deductively here, that means the virus has mutated. It's a different virus. Therefore, you, you need a different vaccine, a different, you know, dead virus, I guess, whatever they put in a vaccine uh, to deal with it. So if you tell me, and, and I, I've, I've, I've seen this too in the, in the media, if you tell me that the antibodies uh, from a person who has had COVID will only last so long, say, I don't know, say six months. Uh, I'm just throwing that number out. That means within that six month period, something has changed. Um, it could be that the antibodies that you have available lose their vitality in the six months. It could be that the blood changes, um, you know, the, the carrier system that, that changes in, in order to make the antibodies effective for longer than an X months period. But it also could mean that the virus that's coming down the pike uh, is mutating. So at the end of that period of time, we have another virus and the antibodies are only addressed to virus A, but not virus B. Uh, is there any thinking about that? So I think coronavirus is a bit different from the influenza virus. Uh, influenza is uh, very commonly known to uh, mutate fairly rapidly so that new strains appear um, each year. They're usually multiple strains of the influenza virus. So the vaccine you get actually is, is trying to provide protection for multiple different strains, not just a single strain. I think when we, uh, from what we know about coronavirus from the SARS epidemic uh, that, that, you know, occurred many years ago, uh, it doesn't have that same frequency of, of mutating. Uh, and we hope that that remains the case uh, because then we could develop a vaccine uh, for COVID-19 that uh, would hopefully be a single vaccine and could be used, even if you had to, even if you had to get it every year, uh, it could be the same vaccine that could be used. Mm, well, that would be great. That would be great, man. That would be a yeah. good result. Although, as everybody says, nobody knows exactly when that's coming down the pike or what it's, and, and there were so many people in the world. It was, a, I saw a newspaper article today with all the candidates for that vaccine and a lot of candidates and you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether the trials would be successful or what. Right. But I wanted to ask you about the, the plight of the cancer patient, because it's a real plight. Uh, so now you have cancer. That's scary. That's scary because it threatens your life. Um, and you have to deal with that. And, you, you know, you're in a certain state of mind. I'm sure you've, you've seen that many, many times uh, about how, you know, you know, your life, mortality. Okay, then the bad news is that something gives you coronavirus. So if, 
to God. It shouldn't be me and it shouldn't be you. But if I had a combination of those things, I would be terrified. Um, what, what, is that a legitimate terror? I mean, is it, is it significantly worse to have both of them? Um, and what happens to people who are faced with the, the double whammy like that? What, what happens to them in the daily course of dealing with doctors, hospitals, researchers? How do they react? So I think, I think cancer patients are generally worried about possibly getting uh, coronavirus. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're fighting uh, cancer uh, that's difficult enough. And then you throw another terrible illness on top of it. I mean, that's a terrible, terrible thing to happen to somebody. What that has done, has, it has uh, directly changed how we're caring for cancer patients uh, at the moment. So a lot of patients don't really want to come into the doctor's office to get checked as often as they should get checked uh, when they're undergoing cancer therapy. They're worried when they come into the infusion center to get their chemotherapy. They know they have to get their chemotherapy, but they're worried because it's a hospital type setting or a doctor's office type setting. And they're worried there may be other people who have uh, coronavirus and they might catch that from it. So we've had uh, lots of uh, disruptions in cancer care related to this. Uh, we're trying to do a lot of physician visits by teleconference, uh, which is okay for some patients, but not okay for some other patients. Uh, but we're trying to do that as much as possible. Uh, we've been delaying uh, some appointments that we don't think are, are critically necessary. Some patients are having difficulty in scheduling surgeries for their cancer. So for many types of cancer, for instance, uh, we often treat it up front with chemotherapy or radiation therapy and then follow that uh, in four to six weeks with surgery. Well, that's not really an elective surgery, like getting a knee replacement uh, could be an elective surgery, could be done this year, could be done next year, uh, but, uh, but it's not an urgent surgery either. And some patients have had some difficulties, uh, especially uh, in the hard hit areas in the country, in getting those types of surgeries scheduled. Because going to surgery requires anesthesia, that requires an anesthesiologist, that requires a ventilator, and those things are in short supply. And so uh, scheduling these surgeries is, has been, been quite difficult uh, for many cancer patients. That just adds to the stress of, uh, of all of the journey sure. uh, with cancer. Yeah. The other thing that I really I think is very important as well and that, that a lot of people aren't talking about is that because uh, we have been delaying routine uh, type visits and routine care, a lot of people are not getting their routine mammograms and scheduled colonoscopies and things that are really important uh, for cancer screening and to catch cancers early and to prevent cancers uh, if possible. And I'm worried about that because the longer that this goes on, the longer those things are going to be delayed. And I'm worried that we're going to have patients uh, with more advanced uh, cancer sometime down the road because they've missed out on their uh, regularly scheduled uh, screenings. So I think that's another aspect of uh, COVID-19 that's affecting um, cancer patients or potential cancer patients uh, that uh, is a little bit unrecognized, uh, something that uh, we're really going to have to address moving forward and try to get people their screening in a safe way. And you could have a double whammy there too. You could not screen. So you have a greater number of cases that require more aggressive treatment. Uh, and then you can have a, a curve that hasn't hit the apex yet, a curve that's going up. We could have that in Hawaii. I mm -hmm. hope we don't, I don't think we will, but it's a possibility. And, and then the medical resources are not available to you. So you have an increased number of patients and you have a decreasing amount of medical resources to treat them. What a combination of events. Uh, yeah. this, could, this could happen. Uh, so. You know, I, I, talking about, um, you know, uh, about what we do about, about uh, solutions, uh, two, two questions I want to ask you about that. One is, one is for the individual patient who could screen, who knows he has to screen or she has to screen, uh, then he should make, she should make every effort to be screened, right? Even if it's a little scary to go into, you know, a medical office with people all around, um, and screen, maybe he should stick to the, stick to the protocol and get screened. Uh, wouldn't that be your advice? 
my recommendation at the moment would be uh, to not worry about screening today, but to not put it off for more than a few months. So uh, uh, perhaps uh, in the summer or the fall, get the screening done, but don't wait a year and don't decide to skip out on it altogether. Okay. And what about situations where, you know, the, um, the medical community really doesn't have the resources? It's, it's got a direct resource to the more e existential threat, which is, uh, you know, the, the cor coronavirus cases themselves. I mean, you can make an effort of X units of effort, or you can make an effort of Y units of effort if you are a cancer patient. Uh, how much effort do you put into that? Uh, or do you just leave it to the system to carry you along and, and find the resources when it's appropriate? What do you think? You know, cancer patients do require a lot of resources, but uh, they're pretty high on the list of, of needy patients. So uh, I think that most centers, uh, when they get past the initial problems with uh, a large number of uh, COVID-19 patients that they have to take care of, are, are really going to try to address uh, the cancer patients uh, pretty quickly and uh, much more quickly than uh, than perhaps other elective uh, health problems uh, that people may have. So uh, I'm not too worried about that. I think all of the oncologists are, are very worried about uh, trying to make sure that uh, we keep our patients on schedule as much as possible and uh, we don't impair their therapy. We know that treatment delays, for instance, or delays in initiating treatment for cancer patients directly correlates with the mortality from cancer. So we don't want those treatment delays. We want to try to keep things on time. We want to get people treated uh, as best we can because we know we have the best chance of curing them if we can do that. So I, I think it's going to be a pretty high priority to get uh, cancer patient uh, therapy uh, back on track uh, as quickly as possible. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, and, and something you said, I mean, it's, it's not just cancer patients who have the need for medical services, non-coronavirus medical services, treatment, diagnosis, what have you. I mean, if, you, if, if, if something is bothering you, you don't know exactly what it is. It could be anything. And so query, should you go to the doctor? Maybe hold back. And if you find out what it is, query whether you should, you know, pursue some sort of treatment or not. Um, and it seems to me, I'm going to throw an idea at you, is that all of this is sort of intimidating. It's intimidating for the patient because he doesn't want to go into an environment like, there's a case in Maui that was in the paper today about a, an elderly woman who went to the hospital and she had some unrelated problem, completely unrelated problem, and she wound up getting coronavirus in the hospital in Maui. Uh, this is not so good. Um, so, you know, people are afraid go into the medical world knowing that the, that's where coronavirus is being treated and therefore that's where there, there's a risk. So I'm, I'm wondering the, you know, how important testing is uh, in that context and um, you know, uh, PP, what is it, FF, FFE? Um, PPE, personal PPE, protective. Sorry, I, I, I'll yes. get it. <laughs> I'm not going to medical school anytime soon. Uh, but I wonder we, how we didn't talk about PPE very much until uh, until this. Anyway, I mean, we knew what it was, but it wasn't it wasn't like we used the the the, the abbreviation every day. Now, now we all know. Anyway, so I'm wondering, you know, that becomes a kind of important thing, not necessarily limited to protecting people, but to give them confidence that if you go into a medical facility, you know, it'll be okay that, you know, this, this is a risk worth taking. And that even if they don't know exactly what's wrong with them, it's okay to go see a doctor. It's okay to be expo exposed to nurses, technicians, what have you, uh, for routine, root, what might be routine med medical issues. Um, so, you know, it seems to me if I was running a hospital, I would say, really got to get testing. Got to be sure everybody in the room, or at least most people in the room who are at risk of having it, of, you know, being able to shed virus, um, they're, they're, they're tested and they're protected and everybody else is protected. And short of the PPE and the testing, you know, you, you can't have a 100% um, level of confidence about that. So how important is that, at least in your analysis? And, and how important is our effort to get those things to our medical professionals here in Hawaii? Well, I think uh, as, as a lot of people have been talking about in the news, uh, testing is key uh, to getting back to some uh, level of normalcy because you, you wanna be able to be sure uh, that 
you're not infected and the people you're interacting with are not infected, um, really testing is going to have to be much more widespread. It isn't available to that extent right at the moment. And we don't really even have the clinical laboratory uh, infrastructure set up to do uh, the level of testing that would be optimal, I think. Um, I think we're fortunate in Hawaii at the moment. Uh, we've had uh, a quite a flattening of the curve, as they say. Uh, we've had a low number uh, of cases uh, that have been uh, um, uh, diagnosed, especially compared to many other areas of the country. So I think that people can feel a little safer uh, here, but at the moment, everybody's going to be a little nervous about going to the doctor's office and going to the hospital because that's where sick people are going to be. And that's always been the case. I mean, for people who have children, they know that going to the pediatrician's office, you knew in the waiting room, you're going to be exposed to a whole bunch of stuff that you probably didn't want to get exposed to. Just sitting there. <laughs> Just sitting in the waiting, waiting room. But it wasn't, it wasn't quite as uh, deadly. Uh, as, yeah, yeah, as yeah, this yeah. Uh, coronavirus, so uh, so that's been. Uh, that's it, may, it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder, you know, you know how the how the physician industry, the primary physician industry, is doing these days. Uh, this has got to have an, It has an effect on every element of our society. But query, what kind of effect does it have on practicing doctors? Um, how are they gonna... How are they dealing with it, and how is it changing their their practices? I, I think we're going to be doing a lot more telemedicine. I think the structure of our offices is going to change. Uh, as, as you know, you go to the doctor's office, you're usually sitting in a room with a whole bunch of other people, and th there's no way that you can do social distancing uh, in, the, in that sort of situation. So uh, I, I think a lot of things are going to structurally change, and it's going to affect the medical uh, community uh, as well. One of the things I know we talked a little bit before we went on air that, uh, that has really affected us uh, and we know it's going to affect us moving forward is uh, our clinical research and clinical trials for cancer patients. This is the way that we find new treatments for patients. And the re one of the reasons that we've seen a decrease in mortality from cancer over the last decade is because we've developed better therapies for patients. Some of it has to do with earlier detection, some of it has to do with uh, prevention, but a lot of it has to do with uh, treatment uh, as well. And we find new treatments by doing clinical trials. You've heard a lot about clinical trials for things related to COVID-19. It's, it's in every press conference. You know, we're doing a clinical trial for this, a clinical trial for vaccines. You do the clinical trials because without the clinical trials, you cannot figure out if something is effective and safe for patients. And for cancer patients, it's really the same. We have to do these trials, otherwise we can't advance therapy. The therapy we give to people today is wholly different from what we gave 10 years ago. And the reason is because we did clinical trials, we found out what was better, we replaced the old stuff with the new better stuff. That's basically what we do. We want to continue to do that. During this pandemic, our clinical research efforts have really taken a hit. It's been very difficult uh, to keep our studies up and going. It's hard to enroll patients onto studies because everybody's focused on this other threat. And I don't, I don't blame them for that. And we've had to cut way back on uh, our access to clinical trials, trying to make those that are particularly important for treatment of patients available. But a lot of the other trials that we do are supportive care treatments, developing new anti-nausea medications, uh, some uh, uh, prevention studies. Sleeping, the hy hypnotic sleeping medications. That, uh, any, any, uh, anything like that. We've had yeah. to put most of those on hold. And that's been uh, really difficult. It's, it's happened across the country. Uh, we have uh, conference calls with our other NCI designated cancer centers uh, at least twice a week to discuss what we do about clinical research, how we can make it available to our patients, whether we can do things by uh, uh, telemedicine, uh, whether we can consent patients for trials uh, without having them come into an office and sign a consent form. We can do that over the phone or over a video. These are all things that are completely changing and I think are going to change uh, how we do clinical research uh, for cancer patients and other patients uh, moving forward. So it's been a real impact on us. It's made it uh, difficult. And we have to also think about our staff, which are usually not healthcare providers. Our clinical research associates who do data management on trials, 
they we have to make sure that they're safe also when they go to uh, to an environment uh, in the hospital and uh, take care of patients and interact with them. Yeah, do you think you think that research should include tracking, or is, is tracking something that doesn't require any medical training? Is just uh, fact finding. Uh, tracking doesn't I think can, doesn't necessarily require medical training, and so uh, some of the people in the Department of Health who are doing epidemiology tracking, uh, I think they're 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 uh, lay people. They aren't uh, medical professionals. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just I wanted to um, ask you about um, um, the the effect on uh, on research funding. Um, so we have we have two point three trillion plus another four or 500 billion coming down from the federal government. Um, are your research programs at JAPSM or the Cancer Researchers uh, Center seeing any of that money? Not at the moment. Nothing that's been uh, allocated is gonna be going to, uh, to research except for research specifically for uh, COVID-19, which is certainly uh, understandable. I think from a cancer point of view, uh, we've actually, uh, are, are very concerned uh, because um, a lot of the way we get funding is through foundations like the American Cancer Society, the V Foundation, Stand Up to Cancer. A lot of these organizations have seen a drop in uh, donations and some of them have actually canceled their grant programs. So we're a little concerned about that. We're also concerned uh, here at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center because we're a state institution we get support from the state and we know the state's gonna have a big budget uh, deficit coming up because of the impact of this on the travel industry. And so that means that the university is likely to see a significant budget impact as well. That's going to affect uh, how well we can do cancer research here at the cancer center. And the reason I think that's so important is because the research we do is specifically targeted toward reducing the burden of cancer for the people of Hawaii, for the populations we have here, for the specific kinds of cancer that we have here. And so if we aren't doing this research here, it's not gonna be done elsewhere. So we would really uh, are a little concerned about the climate uh, for funding uh, for cancer research moving forward. I know that in 2008, after the recession, some money went to the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute uh, that provided some funding broadly for lots of different diseases. I don't know if there are any plans to do that at the moment. Uh, I hope so because uh, funding research actually is a great thing for helping the economy recover because research funding leads to good jobs, which leads to people buying uh, uh, groceries and going to restaurants and paying taxes. So uh, research funding is a good way to diversify the economy. So. I'll put that in as a plug uh, that uh, we need to have good research funding uh, for cancer research. Uh, it'll help the state overall. I remember uh, Ed Cadman's dream as he built the medical school 20 years ago. And he had this, this dream of big pharma with these uh, large research facilities all around the medical school. Unfortunately, it hasn't been, been realized, but that doesn't make it less important. Uh, no, but we, we do bring in a lot of a lot of money. We bring in about fifty million dollars uh, a year in uh, federal money uh, to support research, and most of that goes to paying for people who are uh, have good jobs here in Hawaii. So bet, it does help. Bet. One last question before we break, uh, Randall. I, um, there's been so much talk about uh, drugs that are uh, repurposed drugs, drugs that have no clinical trial background. And, and you can see watching, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump's press conferences, uh, you can just see it on the television. They don't all agree. And uh, some, you know, people, uh, Fauci, for example, you know, you can see from his body language and from his remarks, that's not a good idea. And, and, uh, and then you hear other doctors who have left the federal government, they tell you in, in no uncertain terms, it's not a good idea. So, you know, for a person who has been tested positive and all that, who is worried about it, what, how should he deal with this or she? Um, you know, it, because it's very threatening and, uh, and maybe uh, through a kind of black market mechanism, uh, a friend of a friend who knows what, he can get a whole, he can get a whole of, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, maybe that'll help him even save his life. Daniel Day Kim, the, the movie actor, made a big video about that, saying that it saved his life. How do I deal with that? Or, or do I say, wait a minute, medical 
protocols should prevail here. Let's not take silly chances. What's your thought? I put it in three words, science saves lives. So we should focus on the science and not just focus on anecdotes uh, about what might help. I think all of these things that people have talked about, oh, this may be useful, this, this might be useful, they're being tested in studies. There was a recent study from the VA with hydroxychloroquine. It actually looked so good. People who got hydroxychloroquine did worse than people who didn't. This is why you need to do studies and you need to focus on the real data and the real science uh, behind it. I, I think that it's not bad to repurpose drugs. Repurposing drugs is a great idea uh, but you have to do it in a um, constructive way, and it's best to do it with a scientific foundation. Randall Holcomb, Holcomb of the Cancer Research Center uh, in Japsom, right here in Hawaii, doing world-class work. Thank you so much, Randall. Great to talk to you today. Thank you. Aloha.